Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is uh, an unplanned seminar in our seminar series on ecology uh, and behavioral ecology seminar series of 2022. And uh, I am very happy to introduce to you our uh, speaker. That is uh, Werner Peter Beeman uh, of the Department of Psychology of the uh, Holy Green State University of Ohio, USA. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, adaptive intelligence, neural architecture, and maps that guide animal navigation. But because uh, uh, um, Werner is not a speaker that I personally invited, but someone else. Uh, Professor Anna Gagliardo invited him. I will leave to Anna to introduce Werner much better than what I could do. So Anna, yep. the stage is yours. Uh, hello everybody, and it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, Professor Werner Bingman. And I just uh, say some information about him. Uh, he, he was born in, in New York and he got his uh, bachelor's degree in, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, then he, he did his master's degree and uh, his PhD with, uh, at the uh, University of New York in Albany and he was a, a, a student of uh, Ken Abel. Uh, all of you that uh, are ornithologists or uh, studied uh, animal navigation know very well in April. And Vern uh, 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 got very interested in ornithology and uh, he did his uh, postdoc in Frankfurt with Wolfgang Wilczko, studying the orientation of migratory birds, magnetic orientation of migratory birds. And, uh, and then uh, after Frankfurt, he came to Pisa uh, and, um, at a group of ethologists. He was in, uh, hosted by the group of ethologists uh, guided by Floriano Papi. And he performed some experiments on orientation in birds, also in Pisa. And while he was here, Papi suggested him to get in touch with a uh, Another professor at the University of Pisa, a physiologist, Paola Bagnoli, who was an expert of the brain of birds. And, uh, uh, and Bern started the collaboration also with Paola Bagnoli, and together with other ethologists, uh, produced very interesting. Uh, papers on uh, the neural basis of navigation uh, and uh, uh, after that Bern uh, uh, settled down in Bowling Green State University. He teaches uh, neuroscience at the psychology department in Bowling Green and uh, is, uh, he kept interested in many aspects of uh, uh, neurotology and uh, is still interested in, in many different things with the, uh, with the thread, however, which is the neural basis of behavior and maybe ornithology, but not only. And I think you would enjoy uh, his talk. Uh, so, first. Thanks a lot, Anna. Anna, first of all, thank you very much for your generous introduction, your kind and generous introduction. So here I am, and I can see that we are generally among friends. So let's try to keep it, let's just kind of keep it relaxed. Feel free to ask questions whenever you want to ask questions. To be honest with you, for me this is a little awkward. I usually like see what's up there, but I'm so close I can't see anything. Right, that's a problem. And let me first of all, I'd like to thank all those people that were involved at any level that helped me get to Pisa for this lovely one month stay. 
So particularly Anna and Giovanni Vici were very important in the kind of application process. I don't know what was involved exactly with that. I know I did very little, and then all of a sudden I had a plane ticket to come to Pisa. So what if that worked? So thank you very much for doing that. And I would like to thank the entire Arnino group. You know who you are. You've made this month absolutely enjoyable for me. I enjoyed very much watching you guys doing your research. I enjoyed these social activities. I very much appreciated the camaraderie and the collective kind of sense of mission that you guys share in Arnino. You have a fantastic group. I hope you appreciate that. It's, it's truly an excellent group. I mean, I just really enjoyed it. not just working with you, but watching you work. It was just thoroughly enjoyable. And you know who you are. So I won't, I won't start naming names because I might leave someone out and then they hate me. I don't know. Right, that, would, that would be very nice, right? Okay. I was told to have an hour, which probably scares you. And let me say hello, by the way, to thousands of people out there in cyberspace that are listening to this talk. Well, welcome, wherever you might be. Okay. All right. So again, I, was, I was told I have an hour. Uh, I have a, a bad habit of speaking quickly, especially as the seminar gets later, as it progresses, I get lazier, I get quicker, I start swallowing my words. Uh, but Anna, I told Anna to kind of give me the high sign when things start getting a little crazy. An hour seems a little bit too much, but I have lots here and I'm going to gauge you. You tell me what you want because there's a lot of information here. So let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, just already to start here. So it occurred to me when I was thinking about this talk that I'm presenting at what you guys call Dialogues in Ethology. Dialogues in Ethology. And what it forced me to think about is how much ethology has changed since, say, the 1950s, right? So the, the ethology emerges as a serious science in the 1950s. It's confirmed as a serious science as the Nobel Prize was, was given to von Frisch and Kramer and Tinberg. Not Kramer, Lorenz, sorry. I'm thinking you're, you're the navigation people. I guess you uh, <laughs> Right. And you think about the founding principles of ethology in terms of innate behavior, right? Evolution and innate behavior, releasing mechanisms, things like that, fixed action, you know, fixed action patterns. And something happened, and this thing that what has happened in ethology and animal behavior in general, this started happening in the 1990s, is that there was a gradual transition, I think an exciting transition, away from the historical roots of ethology, again, the more innate evolutionary based, genetic based behaviors, into things that are more clever. In other words, there's the emergence of what we call animal cognition. And I think about when I took my ethology class in 1970, whatever, by a guy named Jack Hellman, who was an eminent ethologist. And the, these ideas of cognition and problem solving, right, and creativity, the sort of things that you guys are saying, would be impossible for him to understand. He would think you were insane. Right? Because really, the, at the essence of any study of animal cognition is trying to understand what we might call, in an undisciplined way, mental processes. Right? And for the old ethologists, you cannot measure mental processes, so you only look at behavior. Right? But somehow along the way, we've got the courage or are willing to admit that there are underlying cognitive processes called the mental processes, through which different types of information can be organized in different ways to enable quite clever behavior. I think some of the work that you guys are doing would be an example of this. Um, a partial legitimization of this kind of new ethology, if you're going to call it. Some people call it animal cognition, but I would call it new ethology or something like that. It was a conference that I was invited to, oh, maybe 10, 15 years ago in Frankfurt, where there was a, this, this session on animal thinking. Okay, this is another thinking, animals think, I mean, the classic ethologists. God, that's crazy. And what was really exciting about those conferences is that they identified four domains, right, of animal cognition. Let's not call it thinking, let's just call it animal communication. This included decision making and planning, right, usual stuff, communication, knowledge, including social cognition, okay, and then they included navigation. I thought that was great, right? Because navigation is often not considered in the context, right? of animal cognition and complex behavior. Okay, so if you think about the compass mechanisms, there are innate compass mechanisms that can be calibrated. If you think about the navigational map of birds, the way it's constructed, if you go back to Walrath's gradient model, some of you might be familiar with Walrath's gradient model, it 
captures spatial information as an algorithm, and algorithms aren't necessarily clever, they work, they're fine, they're not clever, they're not creative. Algorithms are creative, input, output, done. Okay, but this was actually quite fascinating. So I really I appreciated that, and I was glad that navigation is there. And so it legitimizes questions about cognition and navigation, which is kind of what I'm interested in. Okay, let's keep going here. All right, well, let's first get some context. Okay, um, I particularly want to include some of these. I usually don't include these things in this talk, but I've had so much fun hanging out with Lorenzo that I thought, hey, let me throw in some kind of bird migration stuff. So let me introduce you to the large sparrow. Okay, well, let me not. Let me let me figure out what I'm doing here. So I just gonna do this. Okay, going the wrong way. Are we going backwards? Here we go. The lark sparrow. So if Lorenzo comes visiting me next year, this is not a rare bird. It's not a rare bird. Okay, it's not rare, but it is rare in the eastern United States. In fact, the most western population of this bird is in Northwest Ohio, right here. It's a lovely bird, by the way. Right? And you can see the you can see the lark, lark sparrow. What I'm offering here is nothing other than an example, right? And this, this kind of contradiction with the genius of navigation and bird migration, and how routine it is, right? How can something be extraordinary and routine at the same time, okay? But we all know that these, these migratory birds are remarkable navigators. They don't, they don't just fly north or south, okay? But rather, they, they come back to specific breeding sites, they come back to specific overwintering sites, they return to the same stopover sites, and the large sparrow is just one example of thousands of examples. This is not really special in any particular way, right? What is special about this is the use of the geolocators. So these are little geolocators. These are relatively crude devices that can record an approximate position of a migratory bird as it migrates. The problem with the geolocators is you have to get them back to download the data, like the old GPSs. But the beauty of these lark sparrows, okay, is they come back to the same fields, the same field in Northwest Ohio. So we were very lucky. I mean, again, we get these numbers. We had 20 geolocated locators. We saw 12 of the birds. We captured six of the birds. Three of the geolocators didn't work, so we're left with three, three birds. It doesn't really matter. Right? And you can just follow their migration. This is kind of interesting. And, and for the ornithologists among you, what's also interesting about this bird is this, this phenomenon of mold migration. I'm not going to talk about that, but if you're interested, ask me. Right, so you can follow this. So the gold line is basically take during their fall migration to the overwintering sites in central Mexico down here. Again, this is, there's nothing really special about this. And then the green line is they're coming back. And you see they come back the same. This is a field, it's like four soccer fields, five soccer fields, call it 10, call it 10. 10 soccer fields come from Mexico, comes back to the same spot, right? So this is ordinary, though. That's the interesting thing. It's fascinating, but it's ordinary, right? And again, you could pick any species, but I had these pictures, and it was kind of nice. So I went with this, right? You have a ball, like a large sparrow. That's good. Okay, and so let's now move on, if we can. This is not me anymore. There we go. Right. So what is what are, what are the underlying mechanisms that enable this navigation? What are the underlying mechanisms that enable this navigation? And as you're all familiar, many of you are familiar, I'm not assuming you're all familiar, as, say, as many are familiar, what birds have are maps, right? And superficially, we often talk about the navigational map or the bird map. But what I have proposed to some other people is that there are probably more than one kind of map that birds use. And the type of map that's employed depends on the scale of operation, right? So in this little example, this is kind of the, the, the figure that was published. Nice little blackburnian warbler. This is a little Swainson's thrush. Not very attractive, but it's there for a reason. Anyway, so the idea is simply this. How does a migratory bird, what kind of map enables a migratory bird to go from Mexico, or even in the case of the Swainson's thrush, the blackburnian warbler, from Peru to somewhere in Canada? Right? What kind of maps would enable that? So the idea is simply this, right? But you have different maps that have different skits, scales and degrees of resolution. So for example, you might have a coarse scale map. In other words, it's not very precise, it's not very accurate, and this you can kind of get this from here. So if you look at this little figure here, you have accuracy or probability of being correct on the y-axis, and you have distance, apical distance, the distance over which this would be operational here. So in this case, this map here, you have this, oh, it's very useful over very large distances. 
right? But it's not very precise. But if you're a Swainson's thrush or a blackbird even warbler in Peru, okay, you don't need to know precisely where the nest is when you're in Peru. You simply need to go in approximately the right direction. And although this will upset Anna, there is some evidence to suggest that there is that variation in the Earth's magnetic field could in fact explain this kind of coarse scale map. In other words, thinking about a magnetic map as something that pigeon can use that navigates over 100 kilometers, that's not going to work. But if you're navigating over 5,000 kilometers, 6,000 kilometers, if you could extract some crude positional information from variation in your magnetic field, then why not? Right? Then what you can imagine is the bird gets close, and now let's say it's in the Great Lakes region, where, except, for example, an olfactory map can become operational. Right? An olfactory map is not going to work from 5,000 kilometers away. It's not. But it will work in the range of several hundred kilometers. So you can transition here. What's the advantage of changing? Why change? Well, you can see here that although the range of the map is reduced, it has higher accuracy. Right? It has more precision. So that helps you navigate. Like, so at this stage, you're basically the migratory bird is a holding. Right? It's using olfactory map to get closer, and then you can rely on visual features, visual landmarks, and things like that to finish up its navigational journey. That's kind of the idea. Okay? And so let's take a look at some migration here. And again, this is a little bit for Lorenzo, because I'm kind of curious. Uh, again, and as this is not a literature I follow carefully, but what is very popular now in the United States in city bird migration is what, using these Doppler weather stations to get these remarkably high resolution images of bird migration. So these are weather, these are weather radars, but they can scan low elevations and be used to actually see birds migrating at night. And again, in Europe, I get the sense that these are not used often. And I could be wrong, right? So what you're looking at here is a night, this is last, this is May 9th of last year, you have this massive migration. These little dots are all weather stations, and this basically gives you the direction of the migration, because these weather things can enable you to see the direction, and you can see this kind of massive movement, this broad front movement that's going on here. Um, we use this. Okay, this is actually a live picture, it's actually a fall migration. This is actually what the actual pictures look like. So green is the, 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 the population approaching. This is Cleveland, Ohio. This is the birds approaching the station. Red is going away from the station. And this is kind of the region where I start. Now, what I am particularly interested in, in this, in this particular experiment, not experiment, observations as well, is that you have an interesting topography to Lake Erie, right? So in spring, you have these migrants coming from the south. They reach Lake Erie, which is kind of an obstacle. Right? I mean, it's not terribly long here. It might be 80 kilometers, maybe, to cross. And you have these islands that sit through here. But it is a potential barrier. Okay? And the question becomes, is to what extent are migratory birds simply passive responders to compass information as they migrate? Or to what extent are they active decision makers? So they can kind of assess risk in crossing the lake and maybe take a deviation. Right, maybe go this way or this will follow the coastline a little bit. So in the, in this, the results that I want to share with you, and if you don't like this, blame Lorenzo, don't blame me. Okay, is we, what we did is we actually relied on these infrared cameras located in various locations along the Lake Erie coast right here, and we relied on weather radar. So weather radar gives you the broad, gives you the big average picture, right? And this gives you the individual birds, individual bearings as you go. The question was, are the birds along the coast doing something different than the birds in general in the area compared to the radar? Okay, and this is actually quite fascinating. I apologize for this, I could have made this shorter. But to read this, each of these dots is the bearing of one bird that goes through the right hand, right? So if you're sitting in a recording, I do have a video of it, but it's not here. Okay. And these are two locations. And what I want to simply highlight here is the following. Okay, that this is the typical direction of migration, the so-called broad form, the average direction of movement. Right? So typically to the north, northeast. So these are individuals, and these are average for single nights. And what you can see here is that along that Lake Erie coast, yeah, birds are crossing the lake, but a lot of birds are deviating to follow the lake shore. And this is kind of, kind of interesting, right? So the shortest route to their destination would be this way. But no, they're saying, no, I don't want to cross the lake. I'm going to go and follow the lake. I'm going to follow the shoreline. 
But again, if you're if you are a practiced scientist, you know that there's some problems with this. So let's look at the better data. And these are the better data. I guess let's focus on this, shall we? So here are our locations. This is the this is the weather radar in Cleveland, northeast. This is Bowling Green, away from the lake, northeast. This is a location where the topography is neutral. Okay, this Mommy Bay, it's on the lake, but there's no leading line topography. And then there's Cedar Point, right? Which is really not very far. This is five kilometers, maybe, between here and here. But you can see here there's a leading line topography that the birds can go in this direction and stay along the coast. Northeast, north, northeast, north, northeast, north, northwest. You can see a lot of birds going to the northwest. Wow. So there's a lot of birds that are, re that are responding to a particular topography and altering their orientation in a way that can be interpreted as adaptive. How is it adaptive? They're flying longer. How is that adaptive? It's adaptive because it's not risky crossing the lake. What's the risk in crossing the lake? Well, weather. There are, you know, in spring, they're on stable weather systems. It's not unusual. There are reports in Lake Michigan and other places. Thousands of birds get caught over the lake as thunderstorms approach and they die. Right? So there are, even if it's a short water crossing, you know, it's not crossing the Mediterranean, it's not crossing the Gulf of Mexico. But there are risks associated with, and these birds are assessing those risks. Another piece of evidence in support of assessing or decision making is what happens with winds, right? So take a look at this. These are Cedar, this is Cedar Point and Ottawa where we made the observations, okay? That these birds will make a decision. They will shift away from their normal direction and follow the coastline. Some of them, not all of them, some of them, right? But wait, what, what happens if the winds are out of the west, right? What happens if the winds are out of the west? And it's expensive, right? Energetically, making a change all of a sudden becomes energetically costly because you're going into the wind. Well, take a look at this, all right? With, so if you look at Cedar Point, in easterly winds, where moving along the coast will be helped by the winds, you have a large deviation, more birds following the coast. But now if the winds are out of the west, so it's costly, it's expensive energetically to follow the coastline, they head in the normal direction. Same thing in, at this other location, Ottawa, with, with, with tailwinds, they're more likely to deviate along the coast, although not all. With headwinds, less likely to do so. These guys are active decision makers. Remember we talked about the four things at that little conference, decision making? Well, these guys seem to be making decisions in flight. And these are the adaptive decisions that are kind of interesting. I'm not gonna talk much about this. I'm gonna actually skip this because I know I'm already over. I'm not over, but I will be. Um, but just to summarize, this is actually the same kind of experiment that's done in the fall. So you're recording from the, basically the same locations, but these are birds that are already crossed the lake. And the point is simply this, if you're already across the lake, that lake Erie shoreline is no longer relevant, it's no longer interesting. You're there, you made it, move on. And you don't see any influence of the topography in the fall, which of course makes sense. You could argue it's even trivial, maybe, right? But you have to see it. It's trivial, but you have to confirm it, and here it is. So when that coastline is of no energetic or adaptive significance, it's completely ignored. That's, that's the message that would come out of this. All right. We move on. Now, but let's move on to the, to, the, to the stuff that we are all familiar with. But I hope to highlight a couple of things and do my best to kind of make Anna angry. That's always a good thing, all right? So, neural mechanisms. Birds are marvelous navigators, and that took me about only 20 minutes to say, right? Which is that curious. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about neural mechanisms. Let's talk about neural mechanisms. And here, of course, an invaluable model species for study is the homing pigeon, right? And this, again, for half of you in this room, you are more familiar with the navigational abilities of homing pigeons than I am. You are, and you know, we know that they rely on an olfactory map from unfamiliar locations. As they get closer to the home loft, they rely on visual landmarks and landscape features. They have compass mechanisms that they employ. So these, these things provide positional information, perhaps even guidance information in the case of landmarks and landscapes. The compass is always there to help. So the question becomes is that at this scale, right, at this scale, what are the underlying, what are the possible underlying brain mechanisms? And that question from a, from a neuroscience perspective always begins with the question of localization, right? You're going to carry out an investigation trying to understand the underlying neural basis of some behavior, right? The first thing you need to do is identify the brain regions that are potentially relevant. 
right? Where do I start? And in this case, it's pretty easy. Okay? Even in 1984, it was obvious that there was already a substantial conversation going on in the neuroscience community about the campus of the brain and its importance for spatial cognitions. Place cells, which we'll talk a little bit about later, were already discovered. O'Keefe and Nadell's book was already being read by everyone in the field of cognitive neuroscience. So the obvious, the obvious place to start playing, okay, here in Pisa, was to look at the hippocampus. Okay. So I'll just again, just a little bit of anatomy because we do have an anatomist in the room. Okay. And no, Jamal, you're not here yet. You're coming. Okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. Right. So what this slide is simply intended to communicate is that if you look at the bird hippocampus, and if you have any familiarity with the mammalian hippocampus, the first thing you would say is, "You're kidding, right? They're not the same thing. They're different from each other." Right. This would be the avian hippocampus right here. Okay. Uh, I don't have a picture of the male hippocampus, which is disastrous, but that's okay. And what this slide represents is a, um, a radiographic study looking at the distribution of neurotransmitter receptors, different types of receptors. Again, these are just pictures. So the, the hotter the color, the more receptors are located in these regions. And the hippocampus is in here, right in there. And okay, so this is a glutamate receptor, canine is a glutamate receptor. Uh, here, what do we have? This is a GABA A receptor. Again, you look at this region, not this big hot red region here, right, but this region in there. And again, you get variation in the distribution of these neurotransmitter receptors throughout this presumptive hippocampal region. The point is simply this if you did the same thing in mammals, okay, it would be actually quite similar, right? So this is mammal to the right. And you get kind of a similar distribution, which again supports this idea of homology. Okay, this, this, this disastrous image here is basically a summary of pathway connections. So you have the hippocampus somewhere here, and these are the inter this is the internal connectivity, which brain areas in the hippocampus are connected to other areas in the hippocampus. These are areas that are outside, and these make the connections. What's the point? The point is that there's also a considerable similarity in the patterns of connectivity between the hippocampus and other regions of the brain, which again supports this notion of homology. And what this image shows you, these are actually an image from when I did electrophysiology by the day with the students, and I post up electrophysiology. So these are electrodes that went into the hippocampus, and you see electrophysiological responses that resemble what you see in mammals. So, like, so if you look at anatomy, if you look at kind of if you look at um, transmitter distribution, if you look at connectivity, if you look at response properties of neurons, all that evidence is telling you that, yeah, they're the same. They look different, sure, they look different, but it's the same structure, which again legitimizes the idea of looking at the campus, right, in the moment. This is actually, worth, this, is a, this is a detour, but this is actually worth doing. This is worth talking about for many of you, especially if you have any interest in neuroscience, right? What's, what this mess is describing to you, was a study that I carried out together with other neuroanatomists. We came and met together. And what we did is we tried to put together a global map of telencephalic connectivity. Giovanni, you'd be interested. This is actually quite fun for you. Right? So you see this little circle here? What you have here, all these different colors, are what are referred to as modules. So anything within the same color, right? You have strong connectivity between those brain areas. Okay? So you have, right here, you have basically, you have, this is like a super module. So you have light blue, dark blue, it's a super module, cortical hippocampal. This is red and pink, this is a super module or sub modules, and you have auditory, visual limbic, visual, uh, visceral limbic. Okay, that's fine. All these little lines basically describe where we know there's connections from one brain area to another brain area, right? So we know that this parahippocampal region projects to all these other regions in the blue, some of these regions in the light blue. Kind of put that together. There is a bottom line. Here. Don't get lost. Don't get lost. What's the difference between the big circles and the little circles? The big circles are what are referred to as hub nodes. So these are brain regions or nodes within a module that is strongly connected to the other regions in the module, but also connects outside the module. Okay? So if you look at the bird brain, there are two things that I want to highlight. Okay? Bird tongue and cephalon. Okay. One is, it's called, what we have here is modularity. Okay. So there are clear subdivisions or modules that have different functional properties and they are dissociable at an anatomical level. They're dissociable at an anatomical level. 
But there are hub nodes, okay, these big circles, that mediate connectivity across different modules, enabling what we call integration, right? So you have both this modular organization and this capacity for integration across these different functional elements. Sure, let's call it that. Okay. And the important take-home message is that this kind of modular but hub node integration organization is exactly what characterizes the mammalian telencephalon, including the neocortex. You have very similar underlying connectivity architectures in the mammalian brain and the avian brain. And the reason why that's relevant is that if you look at it historically, right, birds are stupid, right? Birds have only become smart since the 1990s, then all of a sudden they're doing all kinds of great things, right? Starting in the 90s, they're stupid until the 90s, they're boom, they're not anymore, right? And one of the limitations, of course, was that birds had brains that weren't particularly sophisticated. Wrong, okay? Because if you look at this level of organization, you have a similar kind of architecture. So whatever the mammalian brain does with the neocortex, the bird brain can do kind of the same thing without the neocortex. Second important point, but I want to highlight, is that there are, there's a dissociable hippocampal region and a dissociable, what do you call it, this associative region. Okay. This for me is interesting. So this, the key structure here would be, of course, the nidopalium. Anne was one of the first people to study the nidopalium in birds. People forget that, but it's true. People think about only a turkin as the nidopalium guy, but Anne actually started before he did. Right. And there's the hippocampus. And again, this, the idea is simply this, is that this, this module controls spatial cognitive processes, and this module would control more kind of classical um, classical cognition, again, like problem solving, decision making, and things like that. Right? Now, as a side note, there's actually a group in China right now that's very interested in trying to relate spatial cognition to decision making processes, and are studying carefully how these, how these red elements and blue elements may be integrated, right? As for example, when a bird makes a decision not to cross the lake, is that being controlled by this red region, okay, which then dictates to the spatial elements what they should do in space. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting, right? So again, so this, so when a New Caledonian crow uses a stick to find food, it's using this red stuff. When a homing pigeon is using landscape features or landmarks to navigate, it's using this blue stuff. That's the idea. Okay, so here we are. It's the 1980s, right? It's the 1980s. You guys were just sperm and eggs in the 1980s, most of you, right? You weren't even you weren't even, you weren't even embryos. So look at this. Going back, this is, that, that. So this is how we used to do pigeon releases, right? You, you GPS people, pop it on, throw it up in there. No emotional investment, right? Here you're emotionally invested. I, I don't know if anyone knows Palo Alto. This is Palo Alto in 1980 something. This is, the, this is the results of the first hippocampal experiment. This is kind of a message for you, Sada. Okay? Because this was an exciting time. Right? So the, the idea was simply this. It's a very simple idea. With, with, with the Poppy group and the Bagnoli group, including Giovanni Cassini, he said, let's lesion the hippocampus. Okay? And let's see how these birds home. With the expectation that they would be really messed up. They wouldn't be able to haul. We, we were literally writing a science paper that afternoon. We right? released the pigeons writing the science paper. That's not true. Either. So we go to these release sites, all right, and here, I don't, I, I don't remember who's who, but the darker control, maybe, and the, the white or the hippocampal lesion, maybe, or it could be the other way around, but you can see it doesn't make any difference. So we go there with the binoculars, the first hippocampal lesion picking goes up ever, right? The first time a hippocampal lesion bird ever was on up here. Paolo's there with the binoculars, or Sergio, so you guys know Sergio has the best eyes on the planet. He's watching and goes, oh, I think that thing went home. So it's only one, it doesn't matter. Next one, boom, boom, next one, home, boom, next one, home, boom. <laughs> it's just going <laughs> All that work, the lesion, it's been hours, out, days, weeks, because then we didn't know what we were doing. Was, you know, so okay, we, we lesion here, we lesion there, you know, it's, just, it's just unknown, right? We're pioneers. And it is, they go, what a waste of time. Right? What a waste of time. But well, the interesting result, okay, is that when we went back to the loft to see who came back at what time, the controls were there, but none, zero, zero, it's not, zero hippocampals came back. We go, wow, this is interesting. 
Right? But what does it mean, right? Did we blow up their capacity to navigate? No, because they headed towards home, right? So maybe they had a heart attack in the way, or we did something, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the bottom line is what we gradually understood, however, is that, well, let me just go back. I won't go back, it's too hard to go back, it's too slow. That their olfactory navigational map was completely unimpacted okay, by the hippocampal region. So they knew where they were from these other, these are actually pretty far away. This is 31 kilometers. So this is close to Siena, 68 kilometers. That's pretty good, huh? You guys don't do that anymore. Those days are over. Um, anyway, um, what became clear is that the olfactory navigation map was fine. But that local navigation phase, the landmarks and landscapes were being used, they could not use them as effectively. Now, there's a reason why they didn't come back, and we quickly understood what we needed to do so they would eventually come back, right? Because no one wants to do histology, right? So it was actually good news. No histology, right? The birds don't come back. No histology. But that's very hard to publish that. Okay. So we figured out what we needed to do to get them back. But even when they came back, it took them much more time to get back, right? It took them much more time to get back. Okay, so let's move on, but not that way. We'll go this way. Okay, so again, this is even now, this is actually pretty old. You can see the old GPS device here, right? Don't, we don't use that anymore. This is this is a uh, this is a the, the one, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> it looks like, it's like something my like, little kid put, it, put the wires together, you buy it, it comes in the mail, something like that. Okay, so this is just an, this is kind of an example. Okay, this is an example of the kind of spatial cognitive process that is compromised by hippocampal lesion and recruits to hippocampus. So again, so let me try to explain this thing because again, I need to remember that not all of you are only pigeon people. So I need to remember that, including the thousands of people listening to us. Right. Um, so in this experiment, right, this is what we did. Because the next slide are the results. It's really it's not suspenseful, but we'll just move on with it. Anyway, we could, we could we use this stuff. There we go. Let's move on. Let's just, just do it. Let's just do it. What did we do in this experiment? Okay, what we did is that we released homing pigeons from two sites. One was Livorno and one was from La Costanza. The only data I'm showing are the ones from Livorno. The only ones I'm showing are from Livorno. It worked from La Costanza too. So these are hippocampal lesion birds and control birds. And they're repeatedly released six, seven times, I don't remember, from La Costanza and Livorno each. The idea is we are enabling the birds to acquire landmark and landscape information that was to engage the hippocampus to learn a group home based on landscapes and landmark features. On test day, okay, what we do is we carry out a phase shift or clock shift. Again, not everyone knows what a clock shift is, but the intent here is to send the birds off in the wrong direction. Here's the logic. On test day, we purposely manipulate the birds because their, their, their olfactory map and compass is going to be prioritized. It's going to send them in the wrong direction. Question, now you're going in the wrong direction. How good are you okay. in correcting for that error? Because a corrective reorientation, and that's up here. Look at that, there it is. Corrective reorientation is a hallmark of a cognitive map. Right? What do maps allow you to do? They allow you to be flexible, right? To alter your behavior, to change your behavior in light of new circumstances, to be creative and problem solving. And navigation is a problem. And sometimes there's a detour. Sometimes the road is blocked. What do I do? If you only know to go straight, turn left, turn right, you're doomed. But if you have a map in space, oh, I need to go over there, let me go this way, that way, you can do that. Right, so again, this is not the best way of presenting this, but it is what it is. So this is the test day. So each of these lines, each of these lines is the path of a route of one bird. Okay. Here's the release site in Livorno, familiar to many of you. This is, I don't think it's the same site, but I need to hear that. Right, so let's look at the controls first, okay? And you can see that many of them go off in the wrong direction. Not all of them, some of them correct immediately. They kind of bounce around Livorno, but then they head back home. Is it good, is it bad? I don't know, but it's a baseline. This is the baseline for comparison. And this is where I really have to, I need two slides here, because they build up to tension, right? <laughs> but you already know, I already know there's no tension. Wow, <laughs> wow, 
right? Again, um, do they get back? Sure, they get back, and we can have a conversation about that, but that's not the interesting thing. Look at these birds, right? They are clearly, their capacity to carry out a corrective reorientation is clearly corrupted because of the hippocampal region. This is why hippocampus gives you, right? This kind of cognitive mapping ability to carry out a corrective reorientation. If pigeons do not have a hippocampus, that capacity goes up, right? You know, look at this guy. Look at this, okay. It's only one, right? You take the you know, what is that? What does a pigeon do over water? Right? You're a biologist, it dies. Right? It doesn't, they don't swim, they don't float. What is it doing out there? Okay, so this is kind of the classic example. This is the class, there the, we have, you know, Anne and I have done hundreds of these things, right? And they all basically give the same message. But, and one, but one thing we didn't completely appreciate at the time, okay? Once again, this curious phenomenon of hippocampal lesion birds heading out to sea. Okay, again, this was the most dramatic one. This guy was just an idiot. Okay, but this guy goes, this guy, this guy, this guy. Look at this. <laughs> goes around. Like it's, like it's the scale here is a little bit bigger. I get it. But still, what the fuck? There's nothing out there. Birds don't, pigeons don't fly over water. Question What is it about a bird without a hippocampus that leads some of these birds, some of the time, to violate a clear topographic boundary. There's the possible and there's the impossible. Even a control bird knows not to try the impossible. Okay? These guys don't recognize this boundary. So this was in the background. We didn't really think about it too hard, right? And it's just curious, but okay, it's what it is. The, the important result was, of course, that they, they were worse than the corrective reorientation. Right? That was the big thing. So, years later, because Anna, as you know, Anna loves the GPS thing. She put a GPS on her hand, so watch out. You can put Velcro on your back one of these days, and something like that. But this is actually, Anna said, listen, you know, if you go back to the 1980s and you look at that first hippocampal lesion study, all you had were vanishing berries, right? All you had were vanishing berries. You know, maybe there's something out there. So why don't we take hippocampal lesion birds, take them to places they've never been to before, right? So here the, re the release sites are out here. I don't know what the release sites are, it doesn't really matter. But they're far away, where their olfactory map would be used. And let's see what the GPS tells us. Let's see how they fly, right? Sure, let's do it. So here we are again, okay, this is, you know, oh, this is one of my favorite pictures, by the way, right? This is Anna playing to the pigeon god, praying to the pigeon gods. Or this owler who's always happy. If he's out there with a sandwich and his stool and his hat, he's a happy boy. That was my daughter many, many years ago. She's now way too old. But you've seen this picture before, I'm sure. If, okay, and I have to remember you're not all homing pigeon people. These diagrams are almost impossible to follow. Okay? So pay attention to the words because you're not going to see it. Okay? You're not going to see it. But if you're truly brilliant, I'll simply tell you what's going on here. These images are of birds. So this is before the hippocampal lesion. So this is before there's after, right? If I remember right. No, there are two groups. It was before and after. It was before and after. Okay. But each release is from a naive, it's from a, a naive site. Right? So this is actually the flight paths of the birds close to the home loft. So the thick line is before lesion and the thin line is after. Well, it's the other way around. Does it really matter? No. Oh, it's written there. Look at that. You figure it out. Like, and all these things are telling you is what we saw before, that after hippocampal lesion, they're taking less direct flight paths near the loft. No surprise there. Right. The more interesting thing, the crazy thing is outside. Okay. So again, thick lines mean something. Thin lines mean something else. But when Anna analyzed the data, this is all her, right? I want to be clear. What she discovered is something truly really extraordinary. What she discovered is outside the area of familiarity, right, where the birds aren't relying on familiar landmarks or landscape features, so where the olfactory map is operational, right, and the compass mechanism is operational. <laughs> I still laugh at this because it's crazy. The birds with hippocampal lesions actually fly straighter. Right? They're actually frustrated. So, again, the way you read this, each of these vectors basically summarizes how straight a path was in individual birds. Okay? And the longer the arrow, the straighter the path, less deviations. Right? Less deviations. Oh, 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 that's a tree. 
So these are the controls, and these are the hippocampal lesion birds, which you can see with the DR if you want to. But these things, yeah, they're both homeward oriented. Okay. But these are longer on uh, average, significantly so. For those of you who think about statistics, I am not among you. Okay. But if you think about statistics, as Anna does, good for her. Okay. It's a significant difference. This is extraordinary. So how do you interpret this? Well, we know that there's a vast body of literature that tells us okay, that when homing pigeons home, they're not simply navigating home, but they often often either they're either responsive to underlying topographic features, right, or they're exploratory, right? So they'll avoid this, they'll follow that. If they're going to different places, it's a kind of exploration. And that's why these vectors tend to be not 100, right? Straight home. No. The idea was that the hippocampal lesion birds were somehow unresponsive over this unfamiliar terrain. The hippocampal lesion birds were unresponsive to the visual features of the landscape, whatever those visual features may be. And okay, now, you guys are ready for this, right? Because you have to pay attention. Because this was really the first formal suggestion. We have the info, the first formal suggestion that these hippocampal lesions may have somehow impacted not just memory processes, but perceptual processes. But there was some alteration in how these birds saw space. Either they had incom incomplete visual fields, the capacity to, to attend to particular stimuli. So it could be, for example, an example, there were numerous clinical human conditions, right? Where an individual can only see one object in a scene, so I could see, I could see, I could see Julia, but I can't see anyone else. I, I can't put the whole picture together. Okay, maybe that's what's going on here, right? They only can spot one thing at a time, or maybe there's a kind of visual neglect. Maybe there's a part of the visual field that they're not seeing. Who knows, right? But the point is, they had never been to those places before. It can't be memory. The behavioral effect of this treatment cannot be a consequence of them not remembering something because they were never there before. So, that, you know, so the idea is that it very much suggests some kind of perceptual consequence as well as a memory consequence to hippocampal lesions. Okay, well, here you go. You think it's pretty in Tuscan, how about Tantag in Ohio, huh? But you lived here, look at that. You have silos and stuff, the trains, anyway. At the same time we were doing this, I was involved in another experiment that was not exactly done the same way. Again, this is one of these opportunistic things which you can never publish unless you sneak it in like a book chapter or something like that. That's where you sneak these things in. So this is a release site. Again, this is Bowling Green. They don't, they don't navigate well. Again, this is GPS tracking. Each color is a different digit. This is direction home. No shop. They don't go home right away because they never do in Ohio. Okay. But these are control birds. Take a look at this. These birds are released here. Home is this way. For some reason, they want to go to Tontogany. Right there, it is Tontogany. You see all that? Crazy. I don't know why, but they do it. Okay. Maybe they like the grain silo. There's a little cafe there. Maybe they like the cafe. I don't know. These are hippocampal lesion birds. Right. So again, they're just as disoriented. They're going all over the fucking place. But for some reason, they don't display the same attraction to. Now again, do I have statistics? No. Do I need statistics? I don't. You might, but I don't. <laughs> right? But, but it's, it's the same thing. Right? It's the same thing. Right? They're just, no, this green guy did it. Fine. Good for you. One. But this guy just, this guy is flying towards the top and keeps going. Same deal. Another thing. Now, let me piss off. Some, can I piss off, Anna? Do you mind? I piss off. It's okay. It's good. All right. So, this is something I'm really interested in. Right? And I have been desperate. To try to find some collaboration with someone who does eyes has eye scanners, right? So you put eye scanners on birds, and the idea with hippocampal lesion, they're, they display less. There's some change in their scanning, visual scanning ability. So they're not sampling the visual space in the same way, which would reflect in some kind of perceptual consequence to the lesion. But I, that hasn't worked. So I said, and let's do something crazy, right? Let's take the birds where it's somewhere where it's featureless, where there's nothing. Right? Except some kind of distant visual cue. And let's see if these hippocampal lesion birds and control birds respond the same way to a featureless space with some kind of distant visual cues right, that would guide them. So you probably know already what we did, maybe not. 
let's, let's just go out to sea, right? So Anna has a good friend, let's go on the sailboat, right? So we're out there, this is actually Livorno, I'm not gonna show you Livorno did it, because they're not as pretty. You never show those, right? This is something, I think this is where the Genovese beat the pieces in 1200 something, right? There's some chains hanging in the cemetery, I don't know. And apparently you don't either. Okay, right? See, there are the pigeons, the pigeons on the boat, they don't like flying over water either, right? And if you've done pigeon releases, you know they do land sometimes, sometimes more often than not. So you have hippocampal and control lesion birds. Now again, Anna says I've lost my mind, and maybe I have. Right? But these are the control birds. So here's a release point, this is up north. Okay? And you look at this, you go, oh, okay, it's kind of interesting, because you have five of the seven birds being released from here in the middle of flipping nowhere, and they all kind of end up in the same spot. Okay? This guy goes, what's the big I don't know what this guy is doing. But five or seven are going to the same spot. In other words, there seems to be some kind of collective recognition, five out of seven, that there's some visual, something visually salient here that's drawing the birds to that spot. Because again, they're not, you know, they're not using their map. Their map would bring them to the spot, right? So they're actually responding in a way to get to the coast as quickly as possible using some kind of visual guidance. See, I told you I would start talking fast. But you're not stopping, so, okay. Now, this, now, now you have the suspense, right? You're feeling it, you're feeling it. I know you're feeling it. Look at these guys. Come on, Anna. Come on. <laughs> Give me a break. Okay, great. You got two guys showing up at the same spot. That's fine. Okay? But you have two out of six. Chi square test P.5, maybe? Sure. Okay. But I think there's something going on. You know, Anna's correct. But doing this again is very complicated. Out there. We got we got into a storm on this on this one, right? I threw up. It was bad. It was bad. It was bad, right? I said that was some risk, right? We delete that from the YouTube video. <laughs> Did I get any some editing going on? Anyway, I don't. Know. But I was looking at this the other day, just to be in preparation. Take a look at this. Look at these guys. These are the hippocampal leisure birds. They're all hanging along the coast as we get back to them. Oh, this I just know. Look at that. There's something going on here, guys. I'm sorry. There's something going on. Look at that. They're all over the place. Boop. Boop. <laughs> What's going on? What is going on? I don't know. Okay, at this point, I need to know what time it is. I need to know what time it is. Time is oh, yes. 4.30. So I'm already at an hour. Isn't that fantastic? Okay, so... All right, so I'll, I'll have one more story for you. Okay. One more story. You'll see what you missed. You missed a lot, right? You missed this. Then we would have looked at electrophysiology, response properties, and hippocampal neurons. This is, this is fantastic. No, no, no. It's, I, no in English, it's tiring. No, I don't want to do that. But you know, the, other, the, 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 the last story. You're not drinking time, so take your time. I'll show you what I could show, okay. and we can come back. Let me squeeze one thing in that I want. Mm -hmm. This, of course, is fantastic. Right? This is actually an interesting idea. These place cells are, are, these place cells are unstable somewhat. The mammalian people call them unstable, but why? Now, birds see the world faster, right? Flicker fusion, you're familiar with flicker fusion frequency? Right? The, birds, the vision of birds is like 120 frames per second, and humans like 40 frames per second. So the world the movement in the world is much sharper, right? They literally live in a faster world. Maybe that's why the place cells are unstable. That's fun. That's a fun idea. We would have talked about this. More importantly, we would have talked about these, this stuff. But this is fantasy. But here's Giovanni. Let's take a moment here, shall we? Shall we take a moment? This is the Campbell Commentary discovered by Giovanni Cassini right over there as I blind him with this. And the point is simply this. This is the, the item what I was going to share with you about is that, and this is actually highly relevant for SADA, is that there's a lot of evidence for functional as well as anatomical lateralization in the hippocampus. Right? So, the, so it becomes very easy to talk about what the left hippocampus does and what the right hippocampus does. And this is a sobering reminder for you that you can talk about that, but they are strongly connected to each other. So this is a, these are axons, this is the commissure. This, okay? This is the, this is the commissure of Cassini. Okay? The, you're right. Cassini something. Okay, and so, and so they're connected, right? So it's not like 
the left and the right hippocampus are completely isolated. And even if you're talking about the visual system, visual system idealization, even there they're not isolated because we know the Volsons connects to the hippocampus, which then connects to the other side. These are just these are neurons that we know. You inject pathway tracing substance here, and they get filled in here. So you know these guys are sending their axons going for that way. Oh, this is going this way. This would be going that way. Anyway, but that is another story. That's another day. You have to have me back. Give me another plane ticket. Right, and then there's the aging story, which is really kind of fun, but that's not going to happen, is it? Okay. But anyway, these pigeons, as they get older, they're, they're actually not as clever. And their hippocampus becomes and their hippocampus becomes less responsive. So if you do an immediate early gene activation as you rely on spatial memory, you get less hippocampal activation in older pigeons. That's kind of neat. Right? Although the hippocampus is bigger. Oh, what's that mean? I don't know. All right, moving on. Then I mean, this is actually kind of fun. I'm not going to talk about this. But let me just mention this is passing. Okay, this is actually worth mentioning. Okay. The idea. Hello. The idea is that there is evidence, particularly from a Korean group, that suggests that the maps that are created by animals, the Campbell maps, maps, are not neutral maps of space, but what they call value maps. So the maps not only capture spatial relationships and spatial information, but they also capture differential reward outcomes, whether they're negative or positive rewards, right? So places where good things happen are highlighted on the map, things where nothing, something less interesting happens or less emphasis, you have more place cells where there's food, less place cells where there's no food, for example. Right? Do you ever get one of those tourist maps? You get peas and that's the leaning tower here, it's a big thing, right? So you have lots of place cells there, right? And then there's some little apartment behind the train station which you don't even see or something like that. So the, the intent of this experiment was to see if in fact if reward property would impact the performance of hippocampal lesion pigeons. And the idea was simply this, that you had different places with different reward outcomes. Again, this is already getting too long. But you have a place where there's always food, like two pieces, you get two pieces of food always. Then there's a spot where you get five pieces of food, but only 75% of the time. There's another spot where you get five pieces of food 25% of the time. Okay? So you have risky locations, and you have one risk location where long term you get more, and you have another risk location where long term you get less, and then you get the predictable spot. Does hippocampal lesions impact that in any way? And of course it does. Right? There are two conclusions that come out of this. It's actually quite interesting. Conclusion number one is that it's not surprising. Oh, okay. I go this way. I go this way. It's not surprising, okay, that the hippocampal lesion birds make more errors. In other words, there's a spot where there's food, 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 and places where there's no food, where the bowls that are empty. And for the hippocampal lesion, they're more likely to make errors. Not surprising, spatial errors. They make spatial errors in these tasks. Right. The more interesting thing you can see here, okay, um, I'll get this some, some point in my life, okay, is that, oh, that's like fatigue, that's fatigue. I mean, this thing's just because we don't punish you. With that's right, there you go, fewer, fewer pellets. Anyway, the, the lesion birds, consistently make more choices to the constant goal. Whether the higher probability that the 5, 75% of the time is present or the 25% of the time is present. In other words, the birds, the hippocampal lesion birds also demonstrate a reduction in their risk-taking behavior, even when being risky would produce a better long-term outcome. Right? If you come to people, and again, if you want to look at this, you know, I hang out with psychologists, unfortunately, and if you want to look at that, it's like they're anxious, they're suffering, there's an anxiety. Right? So no, I'm going to take the two that I know are there. As I go there, sure, I might get five, I often get five. But just, maybe I'll get nothing. No! I don't want to do that. Right? You see what I'm saying? It's kind of interesting. There's something going on here. And I have a graduate student right now who's not very good, not as good as you guys. That's why I'm on YouTube, too. <laughs> anyway, and, and, and um, he's actually doing this, so this is region birds, he's doing it in, in 
wolf birds, they see something interesting. What he's seeing is that their spatial behavior, their spatial memory is still pretty good, but they, are, they also avoid risk. So in other words, if you look at the old birds as a model for aging processes, it seems that temperament, changes in temperament, anxiety, precedes actual performance deficits in space, right? So an old hippocampus is not as bad as a lesion hippocampus, right? So if you look at the timeline of changes in risk behavior, risk-taking behavior, and the timeline in the loss of spatial information, it seems that the temperamental change in risk-taking behavior is more rapid, okay, than the spatial behavior. It's a little bit too early to say, but I'm so glad I said it, because I've never said it before. That was from the hours practicing, by the way, so thank you for that. But, okay, so again, and, but here's the bottom language, and this is also interesting. If you change the task, so the task is a spatial task, but different places, right? If you change the task so that you now have, I'll show you already, they have just simply different colors, right? Blue, red, green, yellow. So the, here, the, the, you know, the, this, this, this guy always has food, so. So the discriminative, the discriminative element is not position in space. The discriminative element is color. And then hippocampal lesions have no effect whatsoever. I mean, it's a great little control. Look at that, I mean, there's nothing. That's why it's in black and white. Why should I even call it? It's boring. Like, but Enzo likes black and white photographs. I'm not convinced. But here, it's kind of the same message, right? Why put colors on it? It's identical, identical, it's identical. All right, I'm not gonna talk about the toes. Just want to sensitize you here that uh, so we're going to we're expanding and moving on to toads, uh, but this also is a nice little summary slide showing that it's not just birds and mammals that hit the, the campus, but there are also reptiles, including crocodiles, which are more related to birds, and even amphibians have a medial pallium here, and I've been involved in quite a bit of research with a group in, in Argentina looking at the medial pallium relation to spatial cognition. And let me just give you the short message. Yes, it's important, right? Medial paleo is important for spatial cognition. Uh, Ruben Muncio, he's the guy in Argentina. This is Ines, she was a graduate student there. We, again, we studied this guy. And we did a test of geometry, which is a classic test of spatial cognition. And you get all the results, right? You get all the usual results. Um, they learn it, they get it. And they set feature in conflict with ge geometric position. They prefer geometry. In other words, this could be here a rat. This, these data could be a rat. These data could be a pigeon. Okay, it doesn't matter. And if you look at CFOS, you see that when they were lying on boundary geometry, you get more neuronal activation in the medial pallium. That's kind of needy, right? And in fact, if one wanted to, you can even study fish, right? So this is the presumptive. Whoop. This is the presumptive hippocampal region in Curios fish. Should you want to go in that direction? So this is my last story. Okay, okay this is going to like, so I just stop this. Again, I won't give you the, the backstory behind this. But I accidentally got involved in research looking at these things that are called whip spiders. I have no fucking idea what they're called in Italian. I can tell you that they're called Geiserspinnen in German. That should help, right? Geiserspinnen. Okay, these are fascinating animals. They live in tropical and subtropical regions. Okay. And they live a long time, 10 years, something like that. Again, they are not true spiders, they belong to the order Amplopigi. Okay, so they're not in the, the spider order, but they are arachnids. And they are remarkable sit and wait predators that have these absolutely vicious claws. They grab, they eat the lizards. I think there's a species that eats fish. They eat a lot of species of fish. In tropical and subtropical, the ones that I'm going to talk about. Uh, actually, that's not true, but let's pretend, are found in Costa Rica. So they are nocturnal animals. So during the day, they go into a home refuge. Right? They, have a, they have a loft, if you will, right? And at night, they come out on these buttresses, and they hang there upside down, or it's upside down. They kind of look like this head down, let's call it that, waiting for stuff to come by, right? And then they eat it. And then, men, and then as, sun, as day comes along, they go back to their refuge, right? So there's a navigational element. And there's this old paper by these bizarre German guys from 1974. That's even older than me. Well, no, that's not true. It's older than my academic career. You could only hope it's older than me, right? Okay, so this is in German, so you could practice that. 
but this is a tree. And what they did is they did this the displacement experiment. I call me creatures. They took a, they took a couple of animals, moved them about what is this about three meters away, and then they watched. Them. And they saw, ooh, this guy went right back to the tree. So they displayed this navigation, the surprising navigational ability. Wow, that's kind of interesting. So now let's jump, what, 35 years later, and we say, okay, let's go back and look at this again, because the lead in this is a woman named Eileen Kiebitz who studies these things. Right, so we said, well, let's be fancy. What we're going to do is we're going to follow them tonight. We're going to adapt, put on these little radio transmitters, and we're going to track them. We're not tracking them, we're getting positions, right? So you don't want to disturb them, so the antenna has to be reasonably close, right? So you, you put on the transmitter, you displace them, and then you come back the next morning and try to find them. So it's not true tracking. Okay, just get in positions every morning. Okay. I talked to Martin about how we could track them and we could say it would be useful. These are fine. Right, so these are kind of the data. These are just some experiments, some displacement experiments. You can kind of look. The bottom line is they generally get back. There's about a 50% success rate in return. I think that's reasonable. So the way you read this kind of thing is this is the home tree, this is one displacement, this is another, this guy came back two nights, these are displacements of about, some of these displacements are three meters, some are eight meters, they're not always straight there, this reminds us of some of the pigeons that we're seeing right now, right? You look at this, um, took it three nights to get back, it did get back, right, it goes to Villareggio before it came to back. But they do, they come back, right? They're successful navigators. We had one animal come back from 25 meters. Let me tell you something. Okay. What you have to fully appreciate, these things are not flying in the air. Okay, guys? Oh, well, that's good. You're in this dense understory, the ground is uneven, right? And they're navigating their way through this, to this, through this space. It's really, it's really amazing if they come back at all. Okay, what about sensory control, right? That's what we think about, sensory control. So we carried out some experiments. Again, this is, I, I realize it's getting really late now. But where we did two manipulations. One manipulation was we cut these antenna follicles. So what's special about these guys? I'm sorry. What's special about these guys is that they have these very long antenna form legs. So they have three pairs of walking legs. So spiders and arachnids have four. These guys have three. And the front legs have, been, have evolved into these sensory appendages. They're extremely long. These spiders are called whip spiders. They're able to move them around. Right, they're able to sample. And those whips are loaded with olfactory receptors, both contact chemoreceptors and, and true atmospheric olfactory receptors, including the chemoreceptors. And the idea was, okay, maybe they're relying on some kind of olfactory signal in the environment to enable this navigation. Okay, that's, that's the idea, right? So we, we either cut or covered the antenna form legs. We'll figure this out just in time to end. Right? And, or we covered their eyes. Okay? And we covered their eyes. And here, I'll simply say, you can kind of, so this is controls, examples. These are animals that have their eyes covered, and these are animals that have their antenna form legs cut. Which again, it's not just olfactory, to be clear, it's not just olfactory, but that is presumably the principal sensory element of all. And you can see that generally these guys come back. These guys don't give us a significant difference. You are, there's a significant difference. Okay, between homing success, if you look at their initial orientation, so these are like vanishing bearings, where are you the next morning? They're not necessarily back the next morning, but where are you the next morning? Right? And you can see that, that I can't figure this out. You can see that. <laughs> you guys are getting hot, imagine me. You can see that the, these are the animals, these are the control animals that have their back legs covered, they're homing oriented. These are uh, the animals with their eyes covered close enough. And the animals with the antenna form legs cut, they're all over the place. Right? This, looks like, this looks like a bird with, a, with a, an osmic pigeon, right? I mean, essentially what you're looking at are control pigeons, um, some kind of control treatment, and then birds that are running, pigeons that are running around with osmic. It's the same flip of thing. Now, again, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily, um, Factory, but certainly suggestive of that. Wow, that was worth waiting for. But we have more to say about this, and we're going to say it because we can. So, but the idea is simply this: this is, this is for, for hypothesis. Okay, so, those are the empirical data, and we should respect those. But theoretically, when we went into this project, the idea was that this navigation is so complex. Okay, 
but it likely is dependent on what we call multisensory integration, right? where multiple sensory inputs are combined to create a more predictive and more reliable spatial representation of the environment. That was the prediction. The empirical data suggests that, you know, basically a tenant legs can explain most of the homing success, most of the navigation success. But in this experiment, we wanted to see if in fact this, this animal is capable of something as complex as multisensory integration. So I am going to take a minute, I know Monique is about to pass out. We're ready though, throw the support, so ready to call. You okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm not convinced. But anyway, so here's the experiment. This is done in the laboratory. And you have the animals are conditioned so that these guys don't like the light. These are nocturnal animals, right? So the way you condition them, it's not good, by the way. You need to get better control of this animal. That's a start. During, you put them in the light, and they want to escape from the light. So here is you're using, you're basically using negative reinforcement, the opportunity to escape from the light to motivate the animals. It's not food, it's not water. And again, it's not the best control, but it is what we it is what we use. And so the animals are allowed to escape from the light, and they go into a spot where, I will figure this out, they can smell a certain odor and feel a certain texture. So by the way, what I didn't mention is that in simple unimodal discrimination, these animals are very good at discriminating different odors. Easy. They're also very good at, different, uh, at discriminating different surface textures. Sandpaper, rough versus smooth. But in this case, you have two stimuli. A certain odor and a certain texture associated with a negatively reinforced outcome of escaping from the light. Okay. You do this over and over again, and then you test it, right? So in the test situation, this is kind of the test situation here. I copied and pasted this in a middle way. But there are three manipulations. One is you give them, let's look at this carefully. Here you give them only olfactory information. Here you give them only texture information, and here you give them both, right? So they're trained to the two stimuli. Question, how well can either of the single elements support discrimination? Or do you require me to figure this flippant thing out, both stimuli in the present, to enable successful discrimination? So here's kind of the animal in the arena, right? So you stick it in the arena, and this would be the CS plus, this would be the good side, this would be the bad side, right? And the idea is, do they spend more time on the good side? That is, that is your dependent measure, something called an association index. So in this test, how much of the time do we spend in the spot where good things happen before? Okay. So for those of you with a psychological background, this is actually a test of configurable learning, okay? And I'll get to that in a second. So let's look at the data. I'm almost done, and then you go, patience. Almost there. So, as I've already told you, this is actually a control experiment we did. So this is how you read the data. This is the discrimination score, the association index. This is random, okay? So if you train them only to the tactile cue alone and test them, you can see they show preference for the side, the, the, the texture that was good. You only train them to olfaction, you show, and you can see here that they should show the association to olfaction. This is the critical result. This is a surprise, guys. I know you're tired and you're in English by now, maybe half of you are listening, maybe, but I do have thousands of people out there in the, in the worldwide <laughs> cyberspace, so at least half of those are still listening. This is fascinating. It's a little bit psychological, it's fascinating. Okay, so when you present both elements that, were, that control the training, the tactile cue and the olfactory cue, you get good discrimination. Yippee. Okay, that's not really a surprise. Here's the surprise, guys. If you present only the olfactory cue, Nothing. If you protect, present only the tactile cue, nothing. The reason why this is fascinating is first, it is a demonstration of multi-sensory learning. The animals learn both the tactile property and the odor property of the good place, and can only discriminate when both elements were present. In other words, they learn what psychologists call a configural representation whereby it's the compound stimulus that controls behavior, and neither of the single elements can control the behavior. This is a relatively higher order associative process. It is associative, okay, you know, experimental psychology stuff. But this is a complete surprise. 
And then now almost done. So it, what this tells us is that, okay, maybe in the field, we haven't really demonstrated the implementation of multi-sensory integration in the support of navigation, but they are capable of it. They're capable of it, and that's fascinating. Now, we have a student working on an experiment right now that rather than doing a multimodal sensory integration tactile odor, we're simply doing unimodal sensory integration, two odors. Order one and order two. So instead of T O, you have order one and order two. And all I can simply tell you, that's all I know, is that the results are funnier, they're a little bit screwier. So it seems that it's easier to get this kind of configured learning when you have stimulus elements of different modalities rather than the same modality. But that's that's what we see again, some other reason giving another point to. Wow. Okay, we won't talk about that. So again, of course, you want, you will always want to bring this and again. Some as a passing note, for those of you who are trying to build a career in science, and if you're interested in behavior, you are certainly more marketable as a eventual as a, as a eventual career in science and university. If you can combine, if you can get some neuroscience expertise, right? though, again, those of you who know, the conservation biologists, the, the ecologists, and things like that, that's fine. But if you're a behavior person, to build your academic portfolio. You are much more marketable if you have some kind of neuroscience in your in your you know, in your in your training. I'm getting tired. Anyway, what we really want to do is okay, okay, so same question. All right, hey, page eight the campus. What about these guys? What are you looking at are these mushroom bodies? Which turns out so the bees have mushroom bodies, ants have mushroom bodies, and they're much more experimentally accessible. I did not know this, but spiders, if you break their exoskeleton. They kind of just, they, they implode, they die, I mean, instantly, I mean, the pressure, you release the pressure from whatever, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not an invertebrate biologist, but the, the fluids inside the spider, you create a hole, the pressure just squirts it all out, and they die. So you can open up the skull of a bee or an ant, and fool around with the brain, and they live. It's very hard to do that with these guys. So there's a lab at Cornell University in the United States that does now, a little bit in spiders, not with spiders, but spiders, but it's not easy. But anyway, we are interested in the mushroom bodies, but quite honestly, we've, we've tried to lesion them, they didn't work, we tried to do some things, tried to do some pathway tracing. This has been terribly frustrating, but I just I just wanted to let you know what I'm thinking about it. Uh, but they're big. What's interesting these root spiders is that these mushroom bodies are enormous. They're huge, right? So what are what these mushroom bodies? Excuse me, but if we're going to talk about it, let's be serious. Anyway, they're located here in the brain, right up here. They actually have a mark. Mar this, so this is the mushroom, mushroom body lobes. These are the, what they call the mushroom body calyces. They're very, very large in these spiders. Okay? And the insect literature tells us that these things are very important in supporting complex behavior. Honeybee learning, you know, a lot of research on the honeybee learning, complex honeybee learning involves the mushroom bodies. There's a lot of calcium in Georgia Arbala Dragata. Is, I don't know if you're looking at the mushroom bodies, there's some kind of visual rule up there, but then there's calcium imaging, it opens up your hands, calcium imaging, and stuff like that. Uh, we would love to move in this direction. What is needed, of course, is a graduate student who's dedicated to figuring this out. Because I ain't figuring out anything anymore. No, I'm not. But so, and they're huge. And just to leave this, a recent anatomy paper from my colleague, Wolfie Gronenberg, which is kind of interesting. But what he has demonstrated anatomically is that in the mushroom bodies out here, you have convergent visual and olfactory inputs. Not tactical, but the point is this, that the mushroom bodies are designed anatomically to support multi-sensory integration, at least with respect to visual input and olfactory input. He didn't look at tactile inputs because he doesn't know where the mechanical receptors go in and stuff like that, but again, it's, certainly this is kind of a proof of concept, but there's some linkage between the mushroom bodies and multi-sensory integration and navigation, and this still needs to be a library. Hey, here's some good news for you. I'm done. Um, again, I just I sincerely apologize for that, but I just need a clock. Mercy. Okay, so this good news. Let's not do this again. But you can blame Lorenzo for this because I added that, that bird stuff at the beginning, right? Which is normally not in the talk. Because of Lorenzo, who's been enormously helpful. So thank you for that. Okay. But again, if you're, if you're, if you're passing out, I'm going to need to go. Okay, 
I guess I can ask answer questions, but you know, or, you know many of you can just find if you have any for those of you, especially those who don't know me, right? Will not see me again. Uh, you know, it's probably more important for you to ask a question than to ask a question. For those of you who might see me tomorrow, you know, maybe it's less urgent. Let's be fine with them. When you might be a little bit cool and you're sweating. But imagine how much I'm sweating. But I'm here. Should I answer someone out there? Is there someone out there? Uh, uh, then uh, I, I will start from the questions in the room. Okay. I will wait for those on the thousand people. The the thousands, 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 thousands. Yeah. Please. Uh, so, Please. So, first of all, uh, any, any questions from the, from the room? From the room. I have a few, but I didn't want to. No, no, no. Well, I, can, I see these guys. Most of these guys are here. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay. Go find me. Come on, we have a lot of pigeons and navigation people here. And then they, they know all the answers. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, I'll start. Please. Okay. But don't kill off. So, um, I think that you give me a lot of ideas actually on the. I, I like system biology okay. and I like networks. So, once you start saying that it's a complex network, and if you modify the 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 hippocamp uh, the, 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 the the comes you modify it's a network so I would expect that to happen that they get confused because the network is to bring the outer so if you you showed us that nice uh, network diagram so and then you had to find many many um, Connections with the, the, the olfactory region, mm -hmm. other regions. So, okay. So, so you, you raise you raise an interesting question. So, okay. So, so okay. If you take your question to the extreme, that the entire telencephalon is a network, right? Because there are these hub nodes that connect different modules together. The, any interference in one location should have a diffuse effect on all those across, and that doesn't happen. Right? So with hippocampal damage, you get very specific deficits in spatial cognition. Right? It's very specific. So for example, I showed that decision making with colors, they're perfectly normal. There's lots of things that birds can do perfectly well without a hippocampus. Right? So, so what's the pro what is the, what is the adaptive property of a network? It's just in general. The, adapt the critical adaptive property of a network is that it buffers against disturbance. Some I mean, node in the network is broken. The other elements can compensate for that 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 disruption, right? So networks are resilient to interference because the other elements in the network can compensate for any local loss. Right? So in memory, for example, you have a memory network. Right? If one element of the memory is lost or something doesn't really use the whole memory, the other elements can stay the same. Right? So so the message that I have is that. Um, that by doing a legion, you are interfering with these, these networks, but there's enough buffering, enough protection in the telencephalic network such that local damage in the hippocampus does not corrupt other cognitive, sensory processes, communication processes. They still able to support themselves. But you do lose, however, because of the tight connectivity within the hippocampus spatial module, that gets longer. Because that lesion in the APH area, so that hub node, which is what we usually damage, the lesion that hub node in the hippocampus system, that blue bit is not corrupt. And that blue bit can no longer be integrated into the other networks, right? So that's why perhaps you're having a problem. So, so now that space can no longer be integrated into the reward network, say, of the base ganglion the striatum, okay, now the striatum is kind of free to do what it wants. As opposed to being, being guided by space, you now see the shift from being risk sensitive to being risk averse. Okay, now I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but that's kind of the way I think about it, right? I mean, like, the networks are good because they're buffering, but local networks are more susceptible to corruption. And if you look at that one image, that's, that's the story they come out. Okay. And then uh, connected to that, uh, the risk behavior. Uh, <laughs> That's fun, by the way. I wish yeah. I could have explained that because that obviously it was. Yeah, I guess you, you have done the, some experiments on 
Gold animals and shiny. No, 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 that's what you guys are doing. Oh, no, 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 no. I have not done that. That's kind of so, no, so, no, no. so they're, 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 we have not done that. We, I actually thought about that in the past with that friend that wanted to do amygdala work. And the idea was to look at shy animals and bold animals which had exploring the food cup. And then actually look at the brains and see if you get differential activation. Just something you might also want to think about, by the way. Where I've done the line, if, you have, if, if, your, if your behavioral characterizations are meaningful, and if you did some kind of immediate early gene, you should be able to see activational differences in some particular areas because the first look would be the immediate. Right. But no, we don't need to do that because our, our, our groups are old and young, or legions or not legions. It's just another dimension. It's, you know, and again, but wouldn't you, wouldn't you expect that hypochondral lead, uh, legion the animals uh, that was born at the beginning to become shy later? After the lesion. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's so, what, so what, you're, what you're telling me then is actually quite interesting. Because there's, there's, there's an opportunity here to do rather than between, there's only one between subject designs. But if you did a within subject design, yeah. it's been an animal pre operation, get some kind of baseline, find some bold ones that are always going to go to the lesion on the campus, and then you have to change the sediment, and then see if they change, if they take a memory change. That's brilliant. That's actually yeah. brilliant. And then related to that, I guess that even the value uh, idea, the, 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 the value map. Yeah, the value map. Yeah. 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 I guess that those values can be different in different ecological systems or different habitats. So in one case, it could be a value that is associated with the chemical or factory cue, and others with the other type of cues. Do you expect? That to affect yeah. the use of different maps in different ecological conditions. So that's that. Again, it's a brilliant question. So our approach to this is not new. That's not so. We just have these two groups. But clearly, risk is not a constant variable. So, for example, a bird in summer and a bird in winter. A bird that's hungry, a bird that's not hungry, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're starving and like two seeds don't make any difference. You're going to risk getting five because two, you're dying anyway. That can be really right. So, certainly, how risk is assessed is not only it's situational, right? And if one takes into account these situational variables, you can come up with all kinds of things. You talk about discriminative stimulus. Actually, I'm more interested in actually the changes in the motivational state. Are the, are the animals are the animals in a deprived state? Uh, what are the interviews? You change the interval between. And stuff like that. So a bold animal might become you know, risk averse because of the particular motivational setting. And it, that for our purposes, that just adds an extra variable. It can only make it more complicated to analyze the data. So we're interested in these, these, these very you know, these, these very distinct differences, legion, not legion, old, young. But within those groups, there's going to be variation that can be manipulated along the lines I'm suggesting. Right? But that that our primary interest is in the brain activation patterns and the chemical dependency. And then it would be a second order question as to how situational variables may compromise these decisions. That should be quite dark. Thank you. Any I have a question on the okay. slide. Perfect. <laughs> It's really interesting how you show the combination of a fat body and fat diet, fat diet sensation, cues, stimuli, and so on. But could it be that uh, they need to uh, to smell some chemicals that needed to be touched? You know what I mean. So this might depend on the uh, on the volatility of the, of the substances. So they need to get in, con in contact uh, with these substances. Okay. So they touch also. So, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of the question, but on these antenniform legs, yeah. there are both tactile chemoreceptors, right? so things that are detecting odors on substances as they're touched, yeah. taste. Right? Yeah. So there are taste receptors and there are olfactory receptors. But Again, these, these tactile cues are do not differ in terms of their odor profile, yeah. but yet they're able to discriminate. Notice if you just give them the tactile cue, I kind of rush through that. 
they can discriminate without any other, any associated odor difference. So that you don't really need that. You don't need to, to the tactile cues need not be contextualized to a specific odor. The big result of the experiment is that if you give tactile and olfactory together, right, what they learn is the combination, right? So, such that one element alone is not enough. Well, what, what do you think they smell? They oh. smell the, the nest. No, 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 okay. So the question then is, is okay, this, is, this is the brilliant question. Can, are they using some kind of beacon, yeah. right? An odor beacon. And they're certainly using an odor beacon when they're recognizing nearby, this is my spot here. But when they're 10 meters away, we played with this and we haven't done a phase shift or anything like that, right? So we don't really know. But the idea, the idea is that is, is it's especially the animal that returned from 25 meters. Again, maybe it was an accident, right? But they routinely come back from 10 meters, right? So in that, in that experiment where we covered the legs and the eyes, those were 10 meter displacements. Those aren't short, that's, that's pretty big. And you have to, you have to cut your way through. So, but they might have a quite a factory language. Yeah. So the experiment would be easy to, to, to test because uh, ah. you can, what? You can take uh, in the field, you can, uh, no in the field, also in the field, but you can uh, maybe use an uh, inexperienced animal. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and see whether they or, or, or you can you can constrain them so that they might have a limited experience on the uh, in a sector of the environment and then you displace them but in another so, so the idea would be that you collect animals, displace them to a new environment, have them establish a new home refuge. Yeah. I mean, if you, if so you control you, their control, yeah. and you say, okay, you're only going to put the displace. Yeah. You build a fence. Yeah. This is the limited space, but that's also the limited. Yeah. What I simply say is this. So you have to invite people to. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll get you a point. It's fair to me. But just, just real fast, I know people want to go. But, um, the, in this, the, so this, this, this is secondary rainforest in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is all cut, right? And there's a dominant tree. It's not the Amazon. It's called Pentacletherum. Okay, it's a, it's a weed tree. It's one of the first big trees that grows out. Okay, they're yeah, very large. And there are lots of these trees. So when we did displacements, there are actually Pentacletherum trees that were not home, that were closer to the witch spider than their home in the cluster, but they would still wrap their back there. So, so now, insofar as the tree, the tree species itself could serve as a beacon, that's not me. Really. Again, most of the trees are just pentacletherum. And mm -hmm. if you, so, so this is a home tree, is, and you displace them here in the pentacletherum, we're still more likely to go here, even though this would be the closer tree. Yeah, but maybe they also add some, some order to the environment. Yeah. And also, even, uh, different trees of the same species might have a different smell. We don't know. Are they territorial? Uh, no. They, but they are territorial with respect to their refuge. Because they share the hunting space, but their refuge is theirs. Yeah, their refuge is theirs. Mm. And for what sort of females are better than males, if anyone cares. <laughs> Does anyone care? Okay. <laughs> females are better navigators than males. Is it possible to do? So, oh, fair enough. No, because when we displace them, yeah, we don't know. If we haven't followed us, we don't know where they've been. But we have to assume that some of these places they've never been to before. Yeah, so, but you don't know. I don't know. Fair enough. They tend to this way. I mean, no, but they tend to stay on the home tree or the buttresses of the home tree. They're not going on the ground. They come out of the tree. You know, they're walking. Some of these buttresses can be very long. You know, the buttresses are the base of the tree that stick out in the tropics, and they'll come down because the soil is very thin. And they'll go 10 meters out on those buttresses. It's pretty easy to hunt and then go back, right? Um, but um, yeah, you can take them places where they've never been to before. Because you're putting them on the ground, right? We're putting them on the ground. I, I don't know, I don't know, but we, we've done enough of them at least some of them came back from places they've never been to. Okay, guys. I mean, Thank you for listening, you guys. You've been very patient. You're actually talking about it tonight, so thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. After the speaking of thousands of my fans and their cyberspace.
Thanks a lot, Bernard, and thanks to everyone online and in present for your participation. I hope uh, you had fun as we did, and uh, see you next year, 2023, for the next series. Bye to everyone. That's it. How many we have out there? What was my biggest number? It was uh, 15. <laughs>